housekeeping. Now today's webinar, uh, again entitled Influenza and Pneumococcal Vaccination Uptake Among Canadian Adults. It will be presented by Dr. Nicole Basta, Dr. Georgia Sulis, and Katie Gravani. And Dr. Basta, who is not able to join us um, in person today, but will be here um, in uh, another form, is an associate, pro associate professor in the Department of Epidemiology, Biostatistics, and Occupational Health at McGill, and holds the Canada Research Chair Two in Infectious Disease Prevention. Um, as an infectious disease uh, epidemiologist, she specializes in conducting biological, clinical, and behavioral studies to evaluate the impact of vaccines and immunization programs and also to increase awareness, acceptance, and uptake, uptake, and to advance our understanding of the epidemiology and natural history of infectious diseases. Um, next, Dr. Georgia Sulis is an uh, infectious disease epidemiologist with clinical background, um, with clinical background, and she's also an assistant professor in the School of Epidemiology and Public Health at the University of Ottawa. Her research program focuses on areas of of top global health importance, such as vaccines, antimicrobial prescribing practices, and um, tuberculosis prevention and care. And we also have Katie Gravania, who is an infectious disease epidemiologist completing her PhD in epidemiology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And her research areas of interest include vaccine uptake and infection prevention in healthcare city, settings. Today, our webinar uh, will begin uh, with a video presentation by uh, Dr. Nicole Basta. So we'll get started with that and then move on to our other presenters. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much, Jen, for that lovely introduction. I'm Nicole Basta, and I'm really excited to be here to share with you the research that we've been doing on influenza and pneumococcal vaccination uptake among Canadian adults. We've gained so much insight from the CLSA, and it's really a pleasure to be able to share that with you today. For today's seminar, we're going to divide our talk into three parts. I'm going to start off and give you an overview of the importance of adult vaccination and talk specifically about what kind of insight we can gain from studies like the CLSA. Next, Katie will speak about the CLSA flu vaccine uptake study that she led while she was a master's student working with my group. And then finally, Georgia will share with us the CLSA pneumococcal vaccine uptake study that she did while she was a postdoctoral researcher working with my group as well. So I'm really pleased to be here with this wonderful team of trainees who have moved on to really exciting new adventures um, and continue to work together on the CLSA studies. None of us have any conflicts of interest to declare either. So influenza and pneumonia are two really significant causes of death among older adults. Both of these infectious diseases really lead to a high number of deaths in Canada and a lot of other countries as well. If we look at the rank of influenza pneumonia among the leading causes of death in Canada, for all three age groups of those ages 65 to 74, 75 to 84, and older than or equal to 85 years, we see that influenza pneumonia contributes as one of the top 10 causes of deaths for many of the last few years from 2015 to 2020. These, this ranking is highest among the oldest age group shown here, but it is still a significant cause of death even among individuals aged 65 to 75, four years old, and those aged 75 to 84 years old as well. And when we think about healthy aging, I really think that the agenda needs to consider more um, seriously the prevention of infectious diseases to prevent not only mortality, but also morbidity. What we know from many studies is that um, infectious diseases such as influenza actually lead to quite high hospitalizations in older adults. So if we look at this chart, which shows the um, influenza associated hospitalization rates per 100,000 population in Canada, we see that Canadian adults aged 65 years and older, which are shown here in the orange line, had the highest cumulative rates of influenza associated hospitalizations at 132 per 100,000, um, even in the most recent flu season, 2022 to 2023. This is really quite alarming and demonstrates that we really need to be taking steps to prevent um, influenza from causing such high hospitalizations in this age group. And it's not only hospitalizations and deaths that we need to worry about. Previous research um, in the US has shown that 
um, adults age 65 and older are at increased risk of other flu-related complications. For instance, the risk of heart attack is increased three to five times in the first two weeks after an influenza infection. And the risk of stroke is increased by two to three times in the first two weeks after an influenza infection. So there are significant severe outcomes that can occur following a case of the flu. And individuals aged 65 and older are at particular risk of many of these outcomes. So as I was just mentioning, who is most at risk of severe influenza and pneumococcal disease? Well, it's older adults aged 65 and older, but not just those individuals. People who have certain chronic health conditions such as heart disease or lung disease or a compromised immune system are also at increased risk of severe influenza and pneumococcal disease. And there's a complete list that you can find from the National Advisory Committee on Immunizations that lists out all of the different chronic health conditions that can put one at increased risk of severe outcomes due to flu or pneumococcal disease. And it is these risk groups for whom vaccination is the most important way to prevent these diseases. Vaccination is truly a cornerstone of prevention that can support healthy aging, especially when it comes to influenza and pneumonia. So let me talk a little bit about influenza and pneumococcal vaccination. Um, influenza vaccination is designed to protect against multiple flu strains. They change every year as the different flu strains circulate around the globe. Influenza vaccination has been shown to reduce the risk of infection, illness, severe illness, hospitalizations, and death. And annual vaccination is required. As I'm sure many of you know, there's an annual flu vaccination campaign that comes up every year, encouraging people to get the flu vaccination at the beginning of the flu season. Similarly, for pneumococcal disease, which is a bacterial pathogen actually, even though influenza is a viral pathogen, for pneumococcal disease, we had two vaccines that were available at the time of the study that you're gonna hear about today, which was 2015 to 2018. And those two vaccines were called pneumococcal polysaccharide 23 and pneumococcal conjugate 13 vaccine. Both of those vaccines protect against multiple pneumococcal bacterial serotypes, the numbers that are in their name, and they reduce the risk of invasive pneumococcal disease, hospitalization, and death caused by these strains of the bacteria. And there's a wealth of evidence that has demonstrated that both influenza and pneumococcal vaccination are safe and that they are the most effective way to prevent severe outcomes from these two pathogens. So what are the current vaccination recommendations for older adults in Canada? Well, first, for influenza vaccination, NACI, the National Advisory Committee on Immunizations, particularly recommends that everyone at high risk of severe outcomes be vaccinated annually at the start of the flu season. This includes the two groups that I've already mentioned, adults aged 65 years and older, and all adults of any age with chronic medical conditions. For pneumococcal vaccination, at the time of our study in 2015 and 28 to 2018, NACI recommended that adults aged 65 years and older receive one dose of the pneumococcal polysaccharide 23 vaccine, and that all adults with certain chronic medical conditions receive one dose of both the pneumococcal polysaccharide 23 vaccine and the pneumococcal conjugate 13 vaccine. And I do wanna note that in 2023, NACI updated their recommendations for pneumococcal vaccine because two new pneumococcal vaccines came on the market, pneumococcal conjugate 15 and pneumococcal conjugate 20. And this is really important, um, something really important to talk to your doctor about if you're thinking about getting vaccinated for pneumococcal disease in the near future. So the national immuniza immunization strategy has set some goals for influenza and pneumococcal vaccination to try to achieve a really high level of uptake. And these goals are 80% coverage for flu vaccine uptake in adults aged 65 years and older, 80% uptake in adults aged 18 to 64 who have at least one chronic medical condition, and 80% uptake for pneumococcal vaccine in adults aged 65 years and older. So these are national targets that have been set to try to improve vaccination rates, even in a country like Canada, where vaccination rates for many routinely recommended vaccines are relatively high. However, when we look at the rates for flu vaccine and pneumococcal vaccines in those three priority groups, we see that efforts to improve vaccination are really urgently needed. So these three graphs show the current uptake of flu vaccine 
um, among individuals 65 years and older in the first graph, flu vaccine among individuals 18 to 64 with a chronic condition in the second graph, and pneumococcal vaccine uptake in individuals 65 years or older in the third graph. And the red line shows that 80% target of 80% vaccination coverage. And you can see that even for flu vaccine uptake in older adults, where we're at about 70%, um, coverage, we still have a ways to go to reach that target. And the situation is even more dire for individuals in the younger age groups with chronic medical conditions and for pneumococcal vaccine as well. So we have a lot of work to do to really reach these targets and ensure that everyone who's at highest risk can be protected. Fortunately, the CLSA is a really unique resource for characterizing vaccine uptake. And I was really fortunate when I came to McGill in 2020 that I got to meet with Tina Wolfson, one of the PIs of the CLSA, and talk to her about how we could use the data from the CLSA to try to better understand and create a more comprehensive assessment of patterns of vaccine uptake for, in for influenza and pneumonia vaccines. And it was out of that conversation that grew the studies that you're gonna hear about today. So data from follow-up one, which happened in 2015 to 2018, can really be used as a baseline to monitor progress towards these national immunization strategy goals. And we can also use the, the data from the CLSA to identify those who are least likely to be vaccinated among this large cohort because numerous potential risk factors for non-vaccination have been systematically evaluated and thoroughly assessed. And this understanding that we could gain could help us to develop strategies to support vaccination uptake among those who need that support in order to get vaccinated. So in our CLSA vaccine studies that we're gonna be talking about today, our overall aims were to characterize flu vaccine uptake and factors associated with non-vaccination among three groups, adults aged 65 and older, adults aged 46 to 64 with at least one CMC, chronic medical condition. And also we took a look at caregivers of all ages and care recipients who are 65 years and older. Because caregivers and care recipients are working in such close um, quarters, we thought it was really important to look at this group to see whether um, influenza vaccination could be improved among those individuals. And then our second broad aim was to characterize pneumococcal vaccine uptake and factors associated with non-vaccination among um, adults age 65 years and older and adults age 47 to 64 with at least one CMC. And we also looked for pneumococcal disease to try to characterize missed opportunities, those times where an individual had a healthcare encounter and received a different vaccine perhaps, but did not receive pneumococcal vaccine even though they were eligible. So that gives you a very quick overview of what we were aiming to accomplish with these studies. And now I'm going to turn the microphone over to Katie so she can share with you the study that she led on flu vaccine uptake in the CLSA. All right, well, today I will be presenting our findings on our studies of influenza vaccine uptake among Canadian adults. Both of these studies aim to estimate the prevalence of influenza non-vaccination and determine the factors associated with influenza non-vaccination between 2015 to 2018 within two population sets. One, those at high risk of severe outcomes, adults aged 65 years and older, and adults aged 46 through 64 years with at least one chronic medical condition or CMC. And two, the second population, those at risk of influenza transmission, as well as potentially at risk of severe outcomes, care caregivers aged 45 years and older, and care recipients aged 65 years and older. Now, one of the reasons that the CLSA data was so beneficial for these studies is that the CLSA provides a uniquely large variety of data on socio-demographic characteristics, health status reports, health services utilization, lifestyle and health behaviors, and economic measures that were utilized in these studies. So in order to achieve our goals for these two studies, we conducted a cross-sectional secondary analysis of the follow-up one data. Variables were chosen a priori, and only variables that were present in both of the CLSA's two cohorts were included in these analyses, although the two cohorts were combined into one data population for analysis. In order to be included in this study, participants needed to have had a valid response, so either yes or no, to the outcome variable of self-reported influenza vaccination status within the past 12 months. A sensitivity analysis was conducted to see if the proportion of participants who reported receiving a flu vaccine by cohort changed if respondents were surveyed during the Canadian flu season, 
which is generally November through April, or outside of the flu season, which would be May through October. And nested multivariable regression models were used to determine the factors associated with influenza non-vaccination. So the first question this research looks to answer was, what is the prevalence of non-vaccination in a population typically considered to be at high risk of severe outcomes from influenza infection? Uh, in this case, adults aged 65 years and older, and those aged 64 and under, with at least one chronic medical condition, um, or CMC, with, and within this population, what characteristics do the unvaccinated have? First, about half of the participants from the follow-up one population, or about 23,000 people, fell within this first group of interest. Of the adults aged 65 years and older, about a third of them reported not being vaccinated against influenza in the past year. The prevalence of non-vaccination was highest in those who reported currently smoking daily, had higher self-rated health, and were residents of the province of Quebec. The next step was to determine which factors were associated with non-vaccination within this group through our regression models. Some of the clearest factors were younger age, in this case being age 64 through 74, compared to older ages, and identifying as non-white compared to identifying as white. Those who reported visiting a family doctor or medical specialist in the past year had notably lower odds of influenza non-vaccination. Our next population of interest for those at high risk of severe outcomes from influenza infections was adults aged 60 or 46 through 64 with at least one CMC. About a quarter of follow-up one participants, or about 11,000 people, fell into this category. Within this group, about half reported not being vaccinated against influenza in the past year. The prevalence of non-vaccination did not differ by type of CMC. Those who were younger or current daily smokers and who were Quebec residents had the highest prevalence of non-vaccination within this group. Now, for the factors associated with influenza non-vaccination within this population as determined by our regression models, we found that the highest odds were associated with the residents in Quebec, living in rural areas compared to living in urban areas, and reporting one CMC compared to reporting two or more CMC was also associated with non-vaccination. Again, those who reported visiting a family doctor or visiting a medical specialist in the past year had notably lower odds of influenza non-vaccination. Now, this study allowed us to draw several conclusions about influenza non-vaccination within this population. For one, both of these high-risk groups were clearly well below the pre-pandemic target of 80% coverage that Nicole discussed. The prevalence of non-vaccination was highly variable by province, which could be due to the confluence of many factors, such as recommendations and practices for influenza vaccination, as well as barriers to vaccination, such as where vaccines can be received or administered at the provincial level. The study also highlights the important role that healthcare encounters may play in getting these high-risk groups vaccinated. For example, they may be more exposed to more recommendations for vaccination at a doctor's office than elsewhere. Risk messaging can also be expanded to target groups who may not consider themselves at high risk, such as younger adults with CMC, who had high prevalence of non-vaccination in this study. Lastly, future studies may want to look at less studied barriers to influenza vaccination, such as the role that frailty may have in preventing older or chronically ill adults from seeking care that includes vaccination. Now, our next study, which is still undergoing the submission process, looked at the influence of vaccination of caregivers and care recipients. Caregivers were defined as those who answered yes to the question, during the past 12 months, have you provided any of the following types of assistance to another person because of a health condition or limitation for a wide range of care activities, such as personal care or health or house maintenance, and care recipients were defined as anyone who answered yes to the question, during the past 12 months, did you receive short-term or long-term assistance from family, friends, or neighbors because of a health condition or limitation that affects your daily life for any of the following activities. And once again, these activities covered a wide range of care activities. Uh, care recipients could receive either professional, non-professional, or both forms of care to fall under this population for this study. Now, about half of the follow-up one population, or about 24,000 people, were in the category of caregiver as defined in this study. About two-fifths of caregivers reported influenza non-vaccination. The prevalence of non-vaccination did decrease with age, but was high in residents of Quebec and those who had at least two other members in their household besides the person who was being surveyed. 
For this group, factors that were associated with non-vaccination included those who identified as non-white compared to those who identified as white and current daily smokers compared to current non-smokers. Once again, individuals who reported visiting a family doctor or a medical specialist in the past year had markedly lower odds of influenza non-vaccination. Now, the next step was to look at non-vaccination for influenza in older individuals who are receiving care due to their high risk of influenza complications as well as transmission. This group was smaller, making up about one-tenth of the total follow-up one population, or about 5,600 people. Within this group, about one-fourth of participants did not receive an influenza vaccine in the past year, and the prevalence of non-vaccination was consistent across types of CMC and across levels of self-rated health. However, the prevalence of non-vaccination did increase as reported household income increased. Now, within caregivers in our study, oh. Now, within caregivers in our study, factors associated with influenza non-vaccination were very similar to those seen in high-risk groups and included younger ages, those who identified as non-white, and current daily smokers, and we had found in the previous study and for other high-risk groups. And as seen before, healthcare visits were strongly associated with lower odds of non-vaccination. Now, this study identified several important components of influenza vaccination in caregivers and care recipients. First, influenza vaccination prevalence remained notably low among caregivers. This is important not only because of the risk of transmission to the people they care for, but for their own health as well. It may be useful to educate caregivers about these direct and indirect benefits to themselves and the people they care for in order to encourage caregivers to get vaccinated. The importance of healthcare encounters is also demonstrated by this study. Getting influenza vaccination recommendations and reminders to those who may not have annual provider visits may improve influenza vaccination rates. Engaging in more positive health behaviors, like annual healthcare provider visits, and healthcare behaviors that are potentially considered to be more negative, like smoking, emerged as the two clearest modifiable factors linked to non-vaccination in this study. Together, these two studies help clarify the state of influenza non-vaccination in groups at high risk of influenza complications and groups at risk of influenza transmission in Canada. Most notably, despite universal vaccination and attempts to reduce other barriers to vaccination within Canada during this time, influenza non-vaccination remained high during the 2015 to 2018 period. Opportunities for education may have been missed for groups who might not view themselves at risk for influenza complications or transmission, particularly younger adults with CMC and younger caregivers. There are also clear disparities in, vac in vaccination within these populations of interest, such as non-vaccination and those who do not identify as white as compared to those who do identify as white that were found in the study that must be addressed. Finally, those without annual healthcare visits also need to be reached to achieve these national vaccination goals. Now, despite the many benefits that come from using the robust CLSA dataset, the study does have several limitations, as do many observational studies. For one, generalizability may be somewhat limited. The CLSA only includes community-dwelling adults, has higher education and socioeconomic status levels than the general population, and excludes groups such as those who reside on a federal First Nations reserve. We also use several self-reported variables in our study, including our outcome variable of influenza vaccination. However, the use of self-report for influenza vaccination status has been validated in other studies. Lastly, we were unable to capture information such as the reasons for non-vaccination, whether an individual was a caregiver as part of a formal paid position or was an informal caregiver, and we could not assess trends in vaccination over time. These are topics that future studies could focus on in order to expand on the work that was done in these two studies. However, it is also important to note the strengths of these studies which include the large sample size of the CLSA and the precision that entails for our vaccination coverage estimates across our groups of interest. The ability to get province level estimates to potentially identify province specific barriers in the future and the ability to analyze the association between influenza non-vaccination and covariates across many vaccine associated domains simultaneously so that these results can provide additional insight on the findings of previous studies. Overall, these two studies show a high proportion of influ influenza non-vaccination across multiple groups of interest and demonstrate next steps that could be taken to continue to understand and address these gaps in influenza vaccination coverage. 
I would like to thank our excellent study team for all of their work on these studies, as well as thank the CLSA for providing their data. Lastly, I would like to share our CLSA acknowledgement and our funding sources. And now I will turn it over to Georgia to speak on her studies. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Uh, just give me a second. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I will now talk about another study that we conducted using the CLSA data, um, which is focused on another vaccine that is recommended to adults to select group of adults, which is pneumococcal vaccination. Um, I will briefly touch only the key elements of our, of our work. Um, so if you're interested in learning more, here is the uh, published article that you may want to look at. Uh, you can access the full text through this QR code, and I believe a link will also be shared uh, to participants um, after the webinar. So as Nicole anticipated uh, at the beginning of this webinar, our aim was to estimate pneumococcal vaccine uptake and differences in uptake among Canadian adults who are eligible to be vaccinated for pneumococcal disease. And specifically, we focused our attention on two groups, older adults, those aged uh, 65 years and older, and adults younger than 65 who have at least one underlying medical condition that increases their risk of invasive pneumococcal disease. So it's very similar to what Katie uh, presented for her first influenza stu vaccine study. We also wanted to identify factors associated with pneumococcal non-vaccination and access the frequency and determinants of missed opportunities for vaccination. And I will explain later what constitutes a missed opportunity. Uh, for this work, we utilize primarily uh, data collected during the follow-up one survey, so collected between 2015 and 2018, although we also utilize some data collected at baseline, mostly sociodemographic uh, variables. Um, as you know, the CLSA originally included more than 50,000 participants, uh, most of whom uh, also contributed to the first follow-up survey. Uh, and we focused on those because we wanted uh, information regarding pneumococcal vaccine uptake. And the first time CLSA participants were asked this question was during follow-up one. Um, among this uh, group, we selected those who uh, met the eligibility criteria for pneumococcal vaccination based on current guidelines. Uh, so essentially older adults, those aged 65 plus, and individuals younger than 65 with at least one chronic medical condition. To define this group, we, we utilized a list of conditions that are known to increase the risk of invasive pneumococcal disease. This is not an exhaustive list. We focused on those conditions that are well, uh, that can be defined well, reasonably well using the CLSA data. Um, we excluded a very small number of individuals who did not respond to the question related to uh, pneumococcal vaccination. Um, and we ended up with more than 22,000 participants aged 65 plus and over 10,000 participants younger than 65 uh, with underlying conditions. So these were our, this constitutes our study population. Uh, we consider two outcomes of interest. First of all, lack of pneumococcal vaccination, self-reported like any other information that comes from the CLSA, and missed opportunity for pneumococcal vaccination. And I'll get back to that shortly. We consider the number of sociodemographic characteristics like sex, sex at birth, age, uh, income level, education level, uh, province of residence, and so forth. We considered various chronic medical conditions, like I said. Uh, we also uh, considered whether uh, participants reported having had a contact with family doctor in the previous 12 months, and whether they uh, reported receiving influenza vaccine in the previous 12 months. Uh, we analyzed the groups of interest uh, separately, so uh, older adults and um, adults younger than 65 with chronic conditions, uh, because obviously they face different challenges and different factors may, um, may come into play uh, in terms of, uh, and may affect vaccine uptake in these groups. 
Uh, so we first conducted descriptive analysis to get a sense of how vaccine uptake varies across subgroups defined by covariates of interest, for example, in males versus females or in, in people living in different provinces and so forth. Uh, we utilize multivariable logistic regression analysis to explore associations between the lack of pneumococcal vaccination and a range of covariates. And we did a similar analysis focusing on missed opportunities again uh, more soon. So let's look at some results. Uh, if we focus on adults uh, age 65 plus, we see that uh, only uh, 54.2% uh, of participants reported having received a pneumococcal vaccine. Perhaps you remember that Nicole in the beginning of this webinar mentioned uh, that the coverage, the vaccination coverage goal uh, in Canada is 80%. So 80% of all adults age 65 plus should receive a pneumococcal vaccine. So it's clear that we are well below this target. And, more, and at least 45% of individuals are not getting vaccinated. And this uh, percentage shown here is in line with national vaccination coverage statistics, which speaks to, uh, the, um, um, to the relevance of the CLSA data and how it is representative of what's happening in the country. But who is more likely to be non-vaccinated for pneumonia among adults age 65 plus? Well, males more than females, uh, those who identify as other than white versus white participants, those living in rural areas versus those living in urban areas, and those residing in, in the Atlantic, in one of the Atlantic provinces compared to those in Ontario, which was such a reference for um, convention. Uh, there are factors that favor pneumococcal vaccine uptake um, after controlling for all other uh, sociodemographics and health utilization indicators and, and so forth. So, for example, vaccine uptake increases with age, increases with income. Uh, it is higher among participants residing in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Quebec versus those in Ontario. Uh, it is higher among those who, um, who have at least one underlying chronic condition. And, but most importantly, uh, the strongest predictor of vaccination, the factor that most strongly uh, affects the likelihood of getting vaccinated is having received an influenza vaccine in the previous year and also having had a contract with a family doctor, not as much as influenza vaccine received, but it's still an important factor to consider. Now let's turn the attention to the other group of interest, adults aged 47 to 64 years, who had one or more underlying chronic conditions. So here the situation is a lot more concerning because we see that less than 20% of participants reported having received a pneumococcal vaccine. So essentially more than 80% are not vaccinated. Um, th there is less variability across subgroups compared to what we've seen for adults older than 65, uh, perhaps because the vast majority here is non-vaccinated. We see something interesting, that is uh, that people with higher income are more likely to be non-vaccinated, which seems quite a bit counterintuitive. I really can't explain this finding. We also found that those residing in Newfoundland, but not in other Atlantic provinces, were more likely to be non-vaccinated compared to those in Ontario. And factors that favor vaccination are again age and and most importantly receipt of influenza vaccine and contact with family doctors so these factors continue to be ex extremely extremely important now i would like to spend some words about um, missed opportunities for vaccination the world health organization defines a missed opportunity as any contact with health services by an individual who is eligible for vaccination which does not result in the person receiving one or more vaccine for which they are eligible. 
obviously, it, not all contacts with health services are likely to result in vaccination for a number of reasons. Sometimes that is not even possible if we think of um, emergency room visits or if you're seeing your doctor because you have a fever. Obviously, even if you don't belong to a, a, an eligible group, uh, if you belong to an eligible group, you, you, you can't receive the vaccine in that very moment because there are contraindications for that. Um, for the purpose of this study, we consider two types of missed opportunity. The first one is the most important, which is receipt of influenza vaccine. This is the ideal um, scenario. This is the ideal opportunity for getting another vaccine uh, for which someone is eligible. Uh, so, because obviously, if you're getting it, one vaccine, like influenza uh, vaccine, uh, there are clearly no uh, contraindications for obtaining another vaccine in that moment. And, uh, and there are no issues at all in um, getting two vaccines at the same at the same time. So this is the ideal situation. Another type of missed opportunity is related to uh, the contact with a family doctor. At least this can be a chance to schedule a vaccination for some other time if it's not possible to get a vaccine uh, immediately. Uh, for both older adults and individuals younger than 65 with underlying conditions, we found that missed opportunities were more frequent among males versus females and among residents in the Atlantic provinces versus those residing in Ontario uh, after controlling for uh, sociodemo for all, all sociodemographic factors. Um, but how frequent is this? It's, it's actually very, very common. If we focus on those who reported having received an influenza vaccine in the previous 12 months, we see that uh, more than 32% of adults aged 65 and older missed an opportunity for pneumococcal vaccination. And this percentage increases to more than 70% among adults aged 47 to 64 with underlying chronic conditions. So a very high number. If we look at those who reported having had a contact with a family doctor in the previous 12 months, we see that approximately 45% of adults age 65 plus missed an opportunity for pneumococcal vaccination. And this percentage increased to more than 80% for older, for individuals younger than 65 who had underlying conditions. So the vast majority missed an opportunity. Now, I would like to uh, just to highlight a few strengths and limitations of this work. First of all, I would like to say that um, the biggest strength is uh, definitely the fact that could, we could rely on an, an excellent data source, which is the CLSA. It is the largest cohort of adults in Canada. And um, it is especially important to address this kind of research question because you know, in Canada, we don't have vaccination registries to record um, vaccination status, especially for adults. So this is the best way for us to access a vaccine uptake among different subgroups and get a sense of how things are going and who is less likely to, uh, to get vaccinated. And it includes participants from 10 provinces. So it's also a chance to look at how different provinces and how different vaccination programs um, um, are, 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 are doing and, um, and how people are, um, are getting vaccinated and whether there is any difference in vaccine uptake between province. Obviously, this also comes with limitation and particular because we, uh, for, for this particular study, we can only uh, use data collected pre-pandemic. And you know that COVID-19 unfortunately has had an important impact on health services, including routine immunization services. And it, it has also impacted uh, attitudes towards vaccination, increasing vaccine hesitancy and so forth. Um, so it is possible that these findings may change a little bit uh, with, um, if, we, if we consider data collected more recently as we're uh, planning to do. Um, this is also just a snapshot of a single point in time because we use cross-sectional data, so there are no time trends available here. Another issue uh, that is important to consider is that all data in the CLSA are self-reported. 
which is not necessarily a problem, but may be problematic for vaccination status because people may not recall perfectly, uh, especially if they received the vaccines a few years before, and especially for something like pneumococcal vaccine, which is something that you receive just once in a lifetime, and it's not like an influenza vaccine that is repeated annually. Uh, but we conducted sensitivity analysis and uh, considered various scenarios. We, we, we simulated scenarios assuming different levels of sensitivity and specificity of reporting. And our, and our findings didn't change much, so this is reassuring. Um, and again, uh, like uh, also Katie mentioned, there's, uh, unfortunately, we, we can't draw conclusions on the reasons uh, why people did or did not get vaccinated. So other studies will be needed to address this, uh, this problem. So in summary, uh, the main takeaways is that um, pneumococcal vaccine uptake remains below expectations of monetary scuttles in Canada. And this is something that we need to work more on to improve the levels of uptake. Um, although we cannot specifically comment on the levels of awareness because they were not specifically investigated in the surveys, uh, we can say that awareness about pneumococcal vaccines is likely low among high risk groups, and this may contribute to this scenario. We also found substantial heterogeneity in pneumococcal vaccine uptake among Canadian provinces, which likely reflects differences in vaccination programs and how vaccines are deployed and are offered in different provinces. And this contributes to the high um, frequency of missed opportunities for vaccination. So more efforts need to be made uh, to address this issue. And with this, I want to thank all the people who contributed to this work at McGill, at uh, the University of Calgary, at the Laos University under the leadership of Nicole. And I would like to thank all the CLSA participants without whom none of this would have been, would have been possible. Uh, so thanks you so much. And thanks also to the, uh, the CLSA team um, who make uh, this resource available and accessible to researchers. So this is a great uh, opportunity for all of us. And now I just give me a second because I uh, have some concluding remarks from Nicole to share with you. Um, Excellent. Well, thank you, Georgia, for sharing your pneumococcal vaccine study as well. Um, now I'm just going to summarize a little bit of what you've just heard about the two studies that we've been working on and emphasize some of the value that we've found in the CLSA for understanding patterns of vaccine uptake. So I can't emphasize enough how much the CLSA has provided significant insight into these really detailed patterns of vaccine uptake among Canadian adults from the years 2015 to 2018 during follow-up one. The comprehensiveness of the CLSA data allowed us to go beyond routine national vaccination coverage surveys, which provi provide a lot of very valuable information. But the CLSA allowed us to investigate multiple factors simultaneously to better understand who is missing out on flu and pneumococcal vaccination uptake among Canadian adults. There truly is very few resources where we could undertake the same types of studies that we've taken with, undertaken with the CLSA data. In these studies, we took the opportunity to focus on two understudies groups who could benefit significantly from flu vaccination as well, caregivers and care recipients. And you heard about this aspect of our studies from Katie. Um, by focusing on caregivers and care recipients, we wanted to look at two groups that really could have great, a great deal of direct benefits from getting influenza vaccine and also could have a great deal of indirect benefits by protecting one another if they were to be vaccinated. We also assessed in our studies missed opportunities for pneumococcal vaccination. And this concept of missed opportunities, which Georgia spoke about, is really, really critical to the vaccine uptake field because we want to minimize the number of healthcare encounters that individuals have to have in order to become fully vaccinated for all the recommended vaccines for their age group and characteristics. But we also want to make sure that people are aware and are getting recommendations from their healthcare providers about which vaccines could really benefit them. So both of these aspects of our analyses, plus the descriptive results, provide much greater insight into who may benefit most from interventions to improve in uptake than previous studies. So for us, I wanna outline some of the next steps that we'll be taking. 
So we're aiming to continue to learn from the CLSA by assessing influenza, pneumococcal, and now shingles vaccine uptake using follow-up two data, and we've just begun these analyses. We aim to compare changes over time in vaccine uptake for, for influenza and pneumococcal vaccine and to refine hypotheses about factors associated with non-vaccination to better characterize those who are not getting vaccinated. And then we wish to use the evidence from our CLSA analyses to design and to evaluate the impact of potential targeted interventions that can improve vaccine uptake among those with low vaccinate vaccination rates. That's really the goal of all of the research that we do in uh, my group, is to try to generate an evidence base that can be used to inform health promotion or health policy in ways that will be most effective in the future. And then we'd like to build on the evidence from our CLSA analyses to better understand reasons for low vaccine uptake and to identify barriers to vaccination in future studies. These were two aspects of vaccine uptake that we weren't able to investigate with the CLSA data, simply because these types of questions haven't been asked of CSL, CLSA participants, but understanding reasons for uptake, at low uptake and identifying barriers to vaccination are really critical aspects of characterizing the vaccination landscape and trying to improve vaccination uh, confidence and also access. So with that, I'll wrap up so we have time for questions. And thank you all for your attention today. I also want to take a moment to very sincerely thank all of the CLSA participants who have given so generously of their time and from whom we have truly learned so much. Your time and participation in the CLSA is really a gift to us researchers who are trying to use your data in um, a way that helps inform um, evidence for future improvements in public health. I also like to thank everyone who's made the CLSA a success, including the PIs, study coordinators, study staff, data curators, analysts, and support staff. As I mentioned, our research team wouldn't be able to um, gain these insights into interesting questions such as influenza and pneumococcal uptake without the incredibly dedicated and hard work that all of you do to make the CLSA possible. So thank you. And finally, I want to thank all of our collaborators with whom it's been a really pleasure to conduct this research. And Georgia and Katie noted all of our collaborators for the, each of the two studies that they presented. Um, so you have a sense of who's been contributing to this work. And finally, I want to thank my research group, which is the Vaccines, Infectious Disease Prevention and Epidemiology Research Group at McGill. We are a group that is really dynamic and always thinking about how we can improve vaccine uptake and how we can learn more about vaccines and vaccination. This has become a very hot topic over the last few years with COVID vaccines, but we work more broadly on a wide range of vaccines in both children and adults. So if you're ever interested in these topics or in collaborating, please feel free to get in touch. Okay, thank you. I think we can go on to questions. Um, the first question, um, and I'll let either Katie or Georgia decide who to answer it, is about the difference in vaccine uptake in the, in the data that you presented versus the StatsCan data, um, and if you have any comment on why it may be different. Yeah, so um, I can go ahead and take this question. So the, the question of why our flu uptake prevalence seem different than the StatCan data is a very interesting question. Um, well, for one, it is difficult for us to compare our influenza vaccination results as a, on an annual basis, since we weren't able to look at flu vaccine uptake trends over time. So the study covered the 2015 to 2018 period, but we weren't really able to break it down. Um, there could be a variety of potential reasons, uh, which is a bit outside of the scope of this specific study, but for example, uh, it could be related to the different number of participants, um, and as I believe another partic participant mentioned, uh, the CLSA and the CCHS do have different recruitment strategies that could lead to potentially different participant characteristics between these two data sources. Uh, so that's an interesting question that we can't quite answer right now, but it's definitely worth thinking about. Um, and then the next question um, is more of a statement and, and uh, Jeff says the CLSA uh, doesn't include long-term care nursing home residents who typically may receive higher rates of vaccination. So um, could this be a factor in the observation that Alain, Alain made? Um, and I will I just, if I can interject on this one. Um, the CLSA does willing uh, collect data from participants who are in long-term care nursing homes. 
um, participants at baseline uh, needed to be within the community, um, but we do have a, a proxy um, questionnaire process so that um, if a participant does require um, the, the aid of somebody that can be done and also our interviewers, um, as long as uh, able, um, will visit um, and complete uh, interviews within long term care facilities or homes. So, so I will, but is there any other comment on that from our panelists? <laughs> Uh, no, I think that that's a, a good explanation of sort of the difference there. Uh, I think you you cover that very thoroughly and uh, definitely, you know, the different recruitment frames are something to take into mind when comparing different sort of survey influenza vaccine data. And so the next question um, says, of course, thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you observe in either of the studies a trend in the onset of progression of age-related diseases either neurodegenerative or metabolic when vaccinated individuals are compared with non-vaccinated. So I think that we, we didn't specifically focus on uh, individuals with uh, neurodegenerative or metabolic uh, diseases or specific conditions. We mostly considered participants um, as a broader group with one or more conditions. So uh, we couldn't actually uh, look into subgroups, mostly due to small numbers. Um, I think the same applies to uh, the influenza vaccine studies that Katie led. Uh, so we could only um, look at uh, overall uptake in, in, in subgroups with certain diseases like uh, cardiovascular disease, like uh, chronic pulmonary disease. Um, we did have something related to neurodegenerative, I think Alzheimer and Parkinson and other conditions that are all known to increase the risk of severe outcomes from both influenza and pneumonia. Um, but again, we didn't specifically investigate these groups, so um, I'm not sure we can comment much on that. <laughs> I mean, we also have a question about the wording of the one question. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. You could probably um, get that to Gloria if uh, she wanted to email you. Uh, so I don't have the exact wording, but it was something like, have you ever received a pneumonia shot? So it was not called pneumococcal vaccination, but it was like pneumonia shot um, in the, in your lifetime. Mm -hmm. uh, because again, pneumococcal vaccination is something, at least in adults, it's something that is given only once uh, or maximum twice, especially for uh, individuals younger than 65 who have underlying condition or are at particular increased risk of, um, of severe outcomes. So in that case, it typically use a conjugate vaccine first, followed by you know, polysaccharide vaccine. Uh, for older adults who don't have additional risk factors, there's just one uh, dose of polysaccharide vaccines. But as Nicole mentioned at the beginning, there was a recent change in the recommendations due to the um, recent approval of two new conjugate vaccines. So this is going to change as well. Mm, so, yeah, the question was, uh, was framed in, using a... a, a a language that could be could be understood from for by by anyone because it was like pneumonia shot which is was how most people know uh, about this vaccine if at all okay well i think that's all of our questions um so i'm just gonna go on to a few last things um again firstly a big thank you to our presenters and uh, who are both here and not here uh for for your participation today um i'd also like to remind everyone if you're interested in clsa data the next application uh, deadline is july 12th and you can visit the clsa website under data access to review um, the available data and details on how to apply. This is the last webinar, I forgot, of uh, this session, and we're actually looking at identifying uh, topics for uh, next winter and spring, and so your feedback that you're hopefully going to submit is going to be very valuable and will help us um, organize those webinars. 
Um, so check on the CLSA website under the webinars tab uh, for details on what those are. And lastly, if, remember the CLSA promotes this webinar uh, series and, and will also promote this one using the hashtag CLSA webinar. And we do invite you to follow us on Twitter at, at CLSA uh, underscore ELCB. And uh, with that, I wish everyone a, a great summer. And uh, depending on where you are today, uh, good air quality, uh, lots of uh, environmental uh, uh, warnings today, but I'm sure within a day or two of some rain, we'll all be uh, breathing good again. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>